All right, so I don't remember if I mentioned this last week or not, but of course, last Sunday morning, I preached on salvation by grace through faith. And what I'm doing is, I'm, I'm going back, of course, you know, we're an independent fundamental Baptist church, so fundamental, I'm getting back to the fundamentals, the fundamental doctrines of our faith, and I'm kind of going through a mini-series of just real basic doctrines that we as a fundamental Baptist church believe. So of course I started off with salvation by grace through faith. Right? It's a very important doctrine. It's, it is the most important doctrine. It is that critical doctrine. But I'm also going to, so I'm going to, following up with that, what I'm going to be preaching on this week is the importance of the Bible, the Word of God, and how we believe that it is inerrant. It means it has no errors in it. There are no contradictions. There is no problems with God's Word because God's Word is perfect. And we believe in this church, you know, we're, we're called a King James only Baptist church. Now, what that means, it doesn't mean, you know, if you come in with another Bible version, we're mad at you or we're upset with you or anything like that. But I'm going to explain what that means. We believe that the King James Bible is literally the only translation that is preserved through the ages in the English language. Now, I'm not saying God's word isn't preserved perfectly in other languages. I don't make that claim. I think it is just fine. But we speak English. That's the language we do. So, so all I'm going to be dealing with is the English language Bibles. Okay. Now, we saw there in Romans chapter 10, and this is why this is so important. I want to lay this foundation right from the beginning. Romans 10 goes a lot. It's, it's talking about salvation. He starts off the chapter saying, you know, my prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. The Apostle Paul has this desire for Israel, the children of Israel, the Jews, to get saved because they rejected Jesus Christ, but he says, you know what, this is my, this is my brethren, these are my people, and I want them to get saved. So he starts off talking about this, but he explains how you know, they're trying to attain their own righteousness and they're not submitting themselves just unto the free gift, receiving that free gift of salvation. And then he continues on and he, and he explains salvation real clearly. So you know, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Just, just make and say, oh, salvation is by faith. It's by faith, that's it. And then he continues on there in verse number 14, and he starts to go on this list. He says, well, you know, in verse 13, he says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's that simple. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then he goes on and kind of backtracks. So he says, well, wait a minute. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? He's saying you can't call on God without believing. Because, you know, we believe that salvation comes by grace through faith. It's that belief that saves you. And he's saying, look, you're not going to call on God unless you believe on him. You know, if you're putting your faith on him, that's when you call out on God. And then he goes back further. He says, well, wait, how shall they believe in him who they have not heard? If you don't know anything about Jesus, it's impossible to put your faith on him. You have to hear about him. You have to know who, you know, what the gift is. You have to hear the gospel in order to believe it. You can't believe in something you've never heard about. It's impossible. I mean, it, just, it doesn't make any sense. So he explains that. And then he goes on further. He says, and how shall they hear without a preacher? So well, wait a minute. If you're going to hear the gospel, someone's got to preach it to you. You can't, you know, you're not just going to pick it up on your own. You have to, someone has to preach it to you, and then he says, and how shall they preach except they be sent? So this is what we do as a church. We send people out to preach the gospel so that people can hear, people can believe, and people can call on the name of the Lord and get saved. It's that simple. This is, this is the whole process. It's a very simple process. So why am I going into all this if I'm going to be preaching on the word of God? Because look at verse number 17. He says, so then faith cometh by hearing, right? People go out to preach the gospel, and hearing by the word of God. The word of God is critical for people to get saved. There's a lot of people out there that will just say, well, you just have to overall just kind of explain the general message of salvation for someone to believe that and get saved. Wrong. Wrong. That is not true. We need God's holy word as the, that is literally the seed that gets planted in your heart that brings life. God's word brings life. Not our words, not our understanding, not our explanation. It's God's word that is, that is able to pierce through the heart and divide asunder the, the soul and the spirit. God's word has, is powerful. That's what the Bible says, that, that God's word is powerful and quick. And, you know, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. That is what's going to pierce the heart. That is what gets planted in the heart. And that is critical for a person's new birth. 
The new birth comes from God's Word. So if you notice on the back of our invitations, we've got the Bible, Way to Heaven. We always have verses in there. Now, And when we go and talk to people, we explain the verses to them, but we always are reading God's Word to them because that is where the power lies. Now this is so important of a doctrine because, because it is God's Word that saves, because it is so important to have God's Word, we need to make sure that we are using God's Word. And here's what I'll put to you. If you have two books side by side and they both say, as mine does, Holy Bible on it, right? They both say Holy Bible. And actually, I've got a few. Here, here's, here's a great example. Holy Bible, okay? And this says Holy Bible. Holy Bible, yes. But you know what? These books are not the same. These two books, this one that I'm holding in my hand over here is a New King James Version, and this one is the King James Version. And, these, and I'm going to get into a lot of examples later on to show you the difference because they are not the same. So if we're going to claim that this is the Word of God and this is the Word of God, well, they better match up perfectly in order to, to put the, the title of God's Word on this book. It needs to be perfect. It has to be. Otherwise, it's not God doing it. It's not God saying it. Those are not God's word if it's not perfect. If, God is, you know, if this book has contradictions within its pages, that's not God's word. Now, it's, it's a couple of things could be going on. Either you're misunderstanding something if you see a contradiction, or there is a contradiction and that's not God's word. Those are the only choices that we have when we, when we find things that might be seemingly contradictions, right? I'm going to show you here, and, and the other thing is, how can you say, and there, there are literally dozens, lots of examples, hundreds, I don't, I don't know exactly how many, but I have seen a lot of examples where the verses literally will say opposite things. Opposite things when you compare the two books. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we need to, you know, I'm going to try to do this in a way that makes sense to me and hopefully it'll make sense to you to present this information on the importance of God's Word and the importance that we're using the right Bible because it is you know, this is the second thing. Like, like, salvation was number one. Now I'm going on to the next important thing is God's Word, right? And really, they're, 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 they're kind of equal with, as, far as, as far as the importance goes because you can't have the salvation without God's Word. So, a brief little history of how we've even received God's Word. I'll read from you for, from a couple of verses. You don't have to turn there. If you want to get ready for the next place we're going to go, Go ahead and turn to Proverbs chapter number 30. But it's going to be a little while before we get there. In Hebrews chapter 1, in verse number 1, the Bible reads, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he, hath ma he made the world's. In Hebrews 1, it explains that, you know, God in the, in the old times, he spake in diverse manner, in different ways he spake to the prophets. He would speak to them in visions, he would, you know, in, in, in dreams. He would also speak to them audibly where they could literally hear God's word. So he spake unto his prophets in various ways. That's what diverse manners means, just in, in different ways. He would speak unto the fathers by the prophets. So he would use his holy men. These guys, and it's what for, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21 says, For prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So there's a lot of people out there today, the world will tell you that, that, oh, the Bible, you know, people who scoff at the Bible and scoff at Christianity say, oh, well, the Bible is just a book written by men. It's just some book written by old men that were misogynistic and, and, and you know, whatever. They have all these problems that, that uh, you know, they use these politically correct words these days to say that they're, you know, this, this male-dominated thing and, and they hated women, they hated all these other people and, and, you know, that's these men who wrote this Bible. No. The Bible is not, you know, God, did God use men to write down his words? Yes. But the Bible is not authored by man. The Bible says that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And here's the thing, you know, by the, the prophets and everything else, these were all things that were said. 
Now, most of you know, they're written down by scribes, but not all of these were by the, the actual hand of the people who, who wrote them down. So, um, you know, <clears throat> when we say this is God's word, you can look at it and say, well, wait a minute. You know, the first five books of the Bible, those are the books of Moses, right? Well, then how is that God's word? I thought that's Moses' word. No. Because God is the author, Moses was the instrument that was used. So if I wanted to write a book today and I came up with, with a story, right, I could use this pen as my instrument to relay that story, right? Or maybe I don't use a pen, maybe I use a keyboard on a computer. That would be my instrument in which I'm relaying that story. Or maybe I just speak it, right? But the, but the, yeah, I could tell somebody else. I could dictate it and someone else can type it down. This is what, you know, the great analogy of what, of what happened with the Bible. God is the author of the Bible. God is the, it's God's word. God is the one who invented this. God's the one who came up with these words. It's not Moses who just came up with these words on his own. It's not Isaiah that came up with these words on his own. It's, but thus saith the Lord. And that's what you, all, you find all throughout the Old Testament, you know, thus saith the Lord. And they write exactly what God said. That was their job. That was the job of the prophet saying, look, this is what God is saying. These are his words. And we have to remember that from time to time when we come to church, that when we hear something out of the Bible, when we're reading something, even if it hits kind of hard or it's something that, that makes you feel uncomfortable, you know, it's easy to get angry at the man behind the pulpit and be like, oh man, yeah, I can't believe you're saying those things. I mean, look, now, if I'm saying things that aren't in the Bible, if it's not coming from here, and they're my own words, go ahead and get mad at me. Okay, that's fine. That's, you know, whatever. But if we're looking at it and it really is coming from God's word, if you're going to get mad at anybody, you have to get mad at God because he's the author of the Bible. Now, you'll even find all throughout Scripture, just to my point of, of God using people, the Apostle Paul, if you look at the epistles of Paul in the New Testament, he's got a lot of books that, that, that are attributed to Paul. Almost all of them, he did not actually physically write. Someone else wrote. Someone else penned them out. He, he dictated them as he was moved by the Holy Ghost. He spoke them out loud. Another person, you know, Timotheus wrote down some of them. You can see, and you can see a lot of times in your Bible, you'll have at the very end of the book, it'll say who wrote, who was actually literally writing. You know, there's one of them, Paul says, you know, you see how large a letter I've written with mine own hand? The reason why he points that out is because normally someone else is writing it and he would just sign off on the bottom so that they could know that this is authentic, it's coming from Paul, that they could see his handwriting and his, his little um, you know, ending to the, to the book would, would verify that, these, you know, that the letters li is actually being sent by Paul. Because even back in that day, there were a lot of deceivers that were trying to corrupt the word of God. And they would send letters out saying that they're from Paul, they're from someone else, and they really weren't. They were being deceitful, and it was easier to get away with that, you know, to some degree, um, maybe back then. But um, that's why he would sign off on those things. But just to give you a little bit more of a, of a history and a background on how we receive the Bible, of course, we have the Bible's account on how we receive it. It comes from God. God used holy men of God to speak, and, and he used it in different ways. He revealed his word in different ways. And then in the last time, of course, it says that he, uh, he has spoken unto us by his son, Jesus Christ himself, actually came and spake the words unto us. So that's where you have you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or all these, these, these recordings of Jesus Christ's words that he delivered unto the people, God's holy word. But let's step back a minute, because that's what the Bible says, and, and, and that's true. But if that's the case, then why do we have so many hundreds of different versions of the Bible in English? I mean, there literally are. If you go to a Bible bookstore, you go to a Christian bookstore, you will find, I mean, it's confusing. There are so many choices to choose from. And if you ask someone, they might say, oh yeah, use this one over here. This is easier to understand. Or, you know, this one's for kids. This one's for women. This one's for men. This one, you know, and they have all these different, different you know, reasons to, to buy these other various Bibles. But I'll tell you what, there's basically two types of Bibles out there. Basically. Okay, I'm going to really um, sum this up and in a way, there's three. But basically, you have 
the King James Version, which is based on the manuscripts that are called the Textus Receptus. Now all that means is just it's the received text. It's the one that has been accepted as, as the common reading. It's this collection of manuscripts uh, from the Greek language from, and from various languages. You know, the Hebrew and the Old Testament. Um, you have Arama a little bit of Aramaic and you've got um, the Greek language. But then there's also sources that, that, were, that were used when this, when this version was translated. There's, you know, there's some Latin. There's some, there's some other languages that have been used. Now, the modern versions rely on the Westcott and Hort texts, which, again, that's a, th those are two people who kind of compiled all these different texts, and they used you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls, for example. Have you heard about the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and some other more modern findings, archaeological findings of manuscripts that date back to be very old? But they're different the, the, basically the, point, the reason why I'm pointing this out, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth and detail in this because you can, I could literally go on and on. There is so much information out there about this subject. And if you're interested, I encourage you to read up on it and study it and look into it for yourself. Um, I just kind of want to point out some, some major, you know, first of all, to have a basic understanding of why things are the way they are. And also, because some people will think that, well, no, it's all based on the Greek as if there's only one source. But that's not true. The source of this book, for example, this is a parallel Bible of the Living Bible and the NIV. The source documents, the source Greek text for the New Testament is a different source than the source that's used for the King James Version. So you're going back to two different authorities as far as what is the truth and what, you know, where is the word of God. And a lot of people don't realize that today. They just think that, oh, it's just a slightly variation of the, of the, you know, the translation from the same source. It's a different source. And we need to understand that because it makes all the difference in the world, where the texts are even coming from. And again, you know, there's, there's a lot of people who are a lot smarter than I am on the subject. I'm not a Greek expert. I don't go back. I also don't believe that we need to go back to the Greek or to the Hebrew in order to understand the Bible. God's word transcends language. He did not make it so that we have to know Greek and we have to know Hebrew in order to understand what he has for us to know. God's the one who created all languages. At the Tower of Babel, when everybody spoke the same language, he's the one that confounded their language, but he's the one who invented them and they started speaking different languages. God is capable, completely capable, of, of, of relaying his word for his word to live and exist in every language that exists. Completely and without losing something in translation. I don't buy that. I believe that God's word is able to be preserved through all languages. So watch out for the people who want to tell you, well, I know that the Bible says this, but what the Greek really means is this. Because now that means you need to rely on some other man to tell you what the Bible means. And God did not give us his word to just have to rely on somebody else to just tell you what it means. We could, we could understand English, we could read English, and we can, we can you know, figure it out for ourselves. If you're saved... You have the Holy Spirit residing inside of you and He will lead you into all truth. God can literally teach you these things. Now, of course, I believe that church is important and you can learn a lot of things from other people. You can learn things from the pastor. You can learn things that are being taught to you. I'm not saying that you, you know, well, just forget it then. I'm not even going to mess with it. You know, I'm not, I, don't, I don't need you to teach me. But ultimately, no, there's, there should be nothing. The point is this. There should be nothing that I teach to you that you can't learn on your own from reading the Bible. I shouldn't have to have this extra special knowledge that only I have and I'm holding that, that key and I'll, I'll tell you what the Bible really means. Watch out for people like that. That's where the deceivers come from. It's like the Joseph Smith. Oh, I found these tablets. I've got the special glasses and only I can read it. Nobody else knows it. Wait, pull the curtain back. Okay. So here's what God said, you know, and, and no. That's not the way it works. That's not the way God operates. But my point is that, so these, these are based off of two different manuscript uh, um, sources. Okay, and now, 
There are lots of manuscripts behind these sources. So I say Westcott and Hoard is this huge collection of all these different manuscripts, and the Texas Receptus is this other whole huge collection. And there are some, some a little bit of back and forth of sharing of, of you know, they're using like the same, the same basis. Um, but I, again, I don't want to get too confusing with that whole, that whole thing. It's, it's best just understand, yes, there are different sources that we're going to, which is a, a big reason for the explanation on why are they different. Why are they different? And I would just suggest this to you is that, you know, if one Bible has a verse written in it and another one doesn't have it at all, well, which one's right? Did God say this or not? Is this God's word or is it not? There is a lot of warning in the Bible about adding to or removing from his word. Look at Revelation chapter 22. I keep your finger in Proverbs. I know I said we were going to be going there and we will. But turn, if you would, just to the, the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, just all the way at the back. God gives a stern warning regarding his word. And it's found elsewhere in the Bible. It's found in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament here. About tampering and messing with God's word. Look at verse number 18. Revelation 22, right at the end. He says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And you know the plagues in Revelation? There's some serious plagues. I mean, that's the, I mean it, like the worst plagues in the whole Bible are found in the book of Revelation. He's saying, you want to add to my words? You want to say something that I didn't say and you want to add that in there? He says, I'll add these plagues unto you. And then look at the next verse, verse 19. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. It's a serious warning. So with that in mind, if we have two books and there's a verse in one, a whole sentence, and it's not in the other one, either somebody added that verse or somebody removed that verse. Either it is supposed to be God's word or it's not. You can't have it both ways. So when you have these two different books, you, know, you can't say, well, they're both God's word. Well, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What about this? And, what, you know, and that's why I hand it out to you this morning, and I don't think... Um, Miss Joyce got one. You can hand that back to her, please. There's a printout here. And, you got, and this is just for your own benefit. You have this on your own. I'm going to keep a, a stack of these on the bookshelf back there, too. These are 16 entire verses that the NIV leaves out. Now, the vast majority of the modern versions will do the same thing. NIV is probably the most popular version, which is why that's used to, to show these examples. But if you have a Living Bible, or if you have a New American Standard Bible, or if you have any of these other ones that are common today, you will probably find the same thing. That these specific verses are completely removed. And what's really interesting about that, you go to these verses, they don't even change the verse numbers. It'll go from 19, like here in Matthew 17, it'll go from verse 20 to verse 22. And what they normally do is they'll put a footnote at the bottom. They'll, say they'll have 21 and a little A or a little B or something. And then they'll say at the bottom that, you know, here's this verse and it's been, you know, the, the old manuscripts don't, don't show that that exists. So it's gone. And that's what they'll do. And sometimes, and again, you, know, it's, you, you have to pay attention to this because sometimes they'll leave it in there. They'll leave the verse in there. But again, with another little footnote saying that this verse doesn't belong here. So either they'll remove it and have the footnote at the bottom or they'll leave it in with that same footnote there so when you go and look at it, it casts doubt. And now, you, now you're reading going, well, wait a minute. Well, what are you saying? Is, it, you know, is this God's word or not? Why, you, know, you start to cast doubt. Well, the, you know, either it belongs here or it doesn't. Why are, you, you know, why are you kind of putting it in and then saying it doesn't belong there? You know, it's confusing. But this is, this is just, so, you know, I'm not going to go through all these today. You, could, you can look at this on your own time. And people will say, oh, you know, but it doesn't affect doctrine. You know, right here it says, if any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Well, who cares if that's in the Bible or not? Well, who cares is that it's God's word. 
That's, that's who cares. You know, you can say something's not important, but if God thought it was important enough to be in his word, then I think it's important. Well, it doesn't affect doctrine. We're going to get into that because there are plenty of scripture that's removed and changed that do affect doctrine very severely. So don't let people tell you that these versions, oh, they don't affect doctrine. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. Yes, it is. It's a very big deal. And we're going to see that. I'm going to prove it to you. I don't, I don't expect you just to believe my word. I'm going to prove it to you. We're going to go through the example so you can see it for yourself. Now, one other point I want to just make about this. This is going to be a little bit longer sermon, so I apologize for that. But it's, it's a very, 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 very important doctrine. And I want you to have as much understanding about this subject as possible, as much as I can relate to you in a, in a shorter period of time. The way that the new versions are translated in English, besides having different sources, is a different method than the way that the King James was translated into English. The modern version uses what's called textual criticism. And it's a fancy word, it sounds real authoritative and scientific and everything else. And, you know, it's all good and fine, but basically I'll try to sum it up as, as simply as possible because it is a rather complicated method that is used for them to turn. So, I, you know, without trying to over, I'm going to oversimplify it, but essentially what it's saying is that their, their basic belief is that the oldest text is the best because... They, they operate on the assumption that there are, without fail, you know, errors where people add things in. You know, someone's, you know, there's, there's, for, there's scribal errors. So when they're, when they're making copies, because remember, this is way, 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 way before printing presses. People had to do everything by hand. So when you're doing stuff by hand, now look, let's be honest. Do people make mistakes? Yes, of course. If I were to sit down and try to copy out this Bible word for word, would I make a mistake? Probably. I probably would. But would I make as much of a mistake on copying this book as opposed to maybe just some other book that I was getting paid to, to, to copy another book? Probably not as many mistakes because I'm going to be reverent towards the Holy Bible. And the people who who were making the copies of the Bible were scribes. I mean, they were people that, that cared about God's Word and would take precautions when they would do the copying. So it's not just like any random thing. You know, you play the telephone game and everything else, and you know, all the words get mixed up, and there's all these mistakes at the end of the line. That's kind of the concept that they operate under when they're using the textual criticism, which in, in one sense it makes sense, but with God's Word, it's a little bit different. It's not the same as every other book. And when you talk about people who are writing these things down, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's much more heavy on their mind whether or not they're going to make because they'll also say they believe that you know people are making corrections now i'm not saying that they don't exist that that scribes didn't do these things i'm just trying to, to explain the mindset of why they why they use a textual criticism so what they're saying is if you could find the oldest manuscript that's probably going to be the most accurate one because there's less chances that people have gone in and, and adjusted them and changed things that basically the later it gets, the more likelihood there is of a scribe saying, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense and changing something or whatever. You know, using their own intuition and, and just, and just cha that does, you know, changing the meaning or whatever and changing the word so that's not exactly what the original said. Whereas the King James Version, the translation method that was used is more of a what's accepted, what's more common. So let me put it this way. So here's why I don't accept the argument of older is, is necessarily better. For one, if a Bible's being used, like I don't know about you, I go through Bibles relatively frequently. They might last a year or two when I'm using it because the pages get old. They get worn. They, I mean, look at, look at this one. Okay, this is my point exactly. The binding is off. It's not going to be very long before I'm losing pages because I use it. Because I'm in God's Word. I'm using this book. I'm going so and I'm showing people God's Word. This is how I use the book. So it gets old and it gets worn out. I don't even have the Bible for, you know, I, I don't think I do, at least for, for like when I first got saved, whatever Bible I had at that time probably doesn't, you know, doesn't even exist anymore. And this is in a short period of time. I mean, that's only like 18 years ago. 
So, to rely just on the oldest version, if people are using God's word and they're, you know, and they're, and they're, they're using them in church, they're using, you know, why would we necessarily think that they're going to survive, you know, for over a thousand years? in that original manuscript. They're probably not. But the copies will exist. And here's the thing. You know, they want, you know, the people want to publish God's Word. It's not like they have just one copy and they hold on to it. Like we have the, the you know, the United States Constitution that's just enshrined in that, in that glass. But how many copies of the Constitution are there out there? I mean, who knows how many? There's, there's tons of them. You know, it's online. It's all over the place. All these copies of the Constitution. So, you have that one original document that they have sealed and everything else. But if they wanted, if someone wanted to forge that and, and was real tricky and, and they were able to go in and change some words, it still isn't going to hold up because we have so many copies of the original now that even if that original was to get changed or altered, you could be like, no, this was not there before because of the preponderance of the evidence because there's so much of these copies out there that were made, they can't all be wrong. They're all saying the same thing. Now, when you're looking at a large selection of manuscripts and they're all in agreement, you know, people typically aren't going to be making the same mistakes. So if there are errors, if I'm copying this down and I make a mistake, well, you know, someone else who might be doing the same job as me and making a copying, they're pr what are the li what's the likelihood that they'll make the same exact mistake that I made in, you know, in the same place? It, it's impossible, basically. It's not going to happen. The mistake that they might make will be different. So what you do is you compare and say, okay, you know, manuscript A says this, manuscript B says the same thing, manuscript C says the same thing, manuscript D has, a, has something a little bit different. Well, guess what? Manuscript D is probably wrong because all the other ones are in agreement. And that's the general rule that's used with the King James Version. Now, they do to some level use that. In all fairness, they use that also to some degree, but it's not quite the same with the newer versions because they have a little bit more of importance on, the, on, the, on how old it is. So they'll say, well, the reason why all of these other ones are saying the same thing is because they're all derived from a source that made a mistake. And they'll go back to the oldest copy, whereas I, you know, I don't believe that that's the, the necessarily the right way to do it. But they're too, just, I just, I'm throwing this out there. You can look into a lot more. Again, I'm, I'm vastly oversimplifying the process. But just to give you the very basic understanding that, one, they're based on different manuscripts, and two, they're based even on a different methodology on how they were translated. And one other point I want to make about this before we get back into the actual Bible um, and, and doing the comparisons and just looking for ourselves is... The differences are actually a lot more abundant in the New Testament versus the Old Testament. The reason being, the Old Testament has generally been accepted as, you know, the Hebrew text has generally been accepted as, like, that's the Hebrew text. There's not a lot of variations within the Hebrew sources for the Bible. Whereas in the New Testament, you know, the Greek, there's, there's all kinds of different, there, there are a lot more manuscripts and there's a lot more variations within the Greek than there is within the Hebrew. But it's interesting then, keeping that in mind, to look at the Old Testament differences and the reasoning that the translators made for making those differences. Because you think, I mean, if there's not really many options for the Hebrew, why is it different? And I pointed out um, in another sermon a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, we, we looked at that one example in the Old Testament, I think it was in Deuteronomy, where um, in the New Versions it says that if a, if a woman is raped then the man who rapes her needs to marry her. That's what the new versions say. Where in the King James Bible doesn't say that. It's, it says what God's Word really says. But see, what that is is an example of someone interpreting the words to mean something different. See, it, the King James Bible never says that a man forces her. It just says if a man lay a hold on a woman and lay with her. Laying hold on someone is, it doesn't mean you're forcing them. I mean, in order, and I explained all this, you know, if, you, if, if you're going to lay with somebody in that sense, you're going to lay hold on them. I mean, that, that's what you do. You, you, you embrace that person, you lay hold on them and lay with them. Basically, what, it's saying, what the Bible is saying is that if, if people commit fornication, then the right thing to do is to get married. 
Because you should, you're supposed to be waiting until marriage to have that type of relationship anyways. But if a man takes a woman and she's a virgin and you go in into her, hey, you need to marry that, that girl. You need to make it right. I mean, that's the right thing to do. And that's what the King James Bible is saying, whereas the, the, the new versions will say if a, you know, if, a, if, if a man rapes a woman that he needs to marry her. And that's a perversion of God's word. That's a perversion of the law. That, that doesn't even make any sense. God's law is not going to require someone who gets raped to then be married to that person. I mean, it goes against all just sound reasoning. But that's not, you know, again, and that just shows you, that's just one example of how the, how the modern versions have twisted even the Old Testament. But um, <laughs> I don't know if I want to get into that. Real quickly, yeah, I'll mention it. I'll mention it because this is, this is really interesting. There are, a lot of, there are people that criticize the King James only belief, right? That, that, that only the King James Bible is the right word of God. And they'll say, they'll, they'll point to a few verses and say, well, look, you don't even have any good Greek manuscripts to back up why this verse should be in the Bible. Now, the first thing that needs to be mentioned is that when, when people bring that argument, there are a lot of manuscripts that don't exist anymore that did exist when, during the time that the, that the King James Version was translated into English. There have been a lot of religious wars that have gone on and manuscripts and documents that have been lost in battles and in, and in wars. I mean, let's face it, when, when there are wars, we don't really think about this very much because our country really hasn't been invaded and we haven't seen the physical effects of war in this country, of buildings being demolished and, you know, it could be libraries, whatever. I mean, when there's war, things get destroyed, right? And there's, there are plenty of manuscripts that have been destroyed that were at the disposal of the translators 400 years ago. They don't exist anymore today. So if we're just going to look at today's evidence and say, oh, well, you don't even have any, any evidence to, to support that claim. Well, they did back then. And, but see, it's, you can't prove that because it doesn't exist right now today. But just to assume that it, it never existed is a, false, is a faulty assumption. You can't, you can't necessarily say that. But what, the reason why I'm even bringing this up, that they, they bring that, they, they say that, oh, well, how can you justify... You know, 1 John 5, 7 being in the Bible when there's no good Greek manuscript that even has that as a support. It's only in these other translations and other languages. Well, what's hypocritical about that is that they do the very same thing with the Hebrew. <laughs> so they'll take, the, you have the whole Hebrew text and they add verses in where it's not found in the Hebrew anywhere, but let's say it is, for example, found in the Septuagint. It's in, it's in the Greek version of the Old Testament, or it's in some other language of the Old Testament, and they'll say, well, this is why we're going to add this in here, because this makes more sense. But then they'll turn around and say, well, why do you have this verse? You know, it's, just, it's hypocrisy is what it is. Um, but anyways, I, I wanted to just mention that. You're in Proverbs 30. That's all just kind of a, a, a real trying to be as basic as possible of, of a background and understanding of some of the differences in, in the modern versions from, a, from humanly speaking. Now we're going to look into God's Word and I'm going to explain to you how we have an every word Bible today. And the only way we can have an every word Bible is if God has preserved it. If we're not just relying on man to preserve it, but if God truly preserved his word, then we have it today. And I believe that to be true, and I'm going to prove that from Scripture, from God's own words, that he has promised to preserve his word, and that we can trust and have faith and have zero doubt in our mind that God has preserved his word for us today, and we have a Bible that contains every word of God. Proverbs chapter 30 is where I had you turn. Look at verse number 5. The Bible reads, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar. So here we're saying, you know, every, every word of God is pure. Every single one of them. It's pure, it's holy, and it's, there's going to be no contradictions in it. And this is another warning, as you know, I mentioned, we saw in Revelation 22, a real stern warning. But this says, look, don't add unto God's words. Don't add your own opinions and your own thoughts and your own everything else. He says, lest he reprove thee, basically tell you you're wrong, and you'd be found a liar. 
There's a lot of people out there today. There's a lot of religion, a lot of Christian religions will say, oh, I got this word from God. And they'll start going on about how God told them this and God told them that. We were at a funeral once and, and uh, a service for, for, you know, for a, a guy that died in our family. And, you know, the, the, the preacher was started saying, to the, to the children of the, of the man who passed away, you know, God told me last night, you're going to do this. And he's like, look, I don't believe that. I don't believe that God is just speaking to people. In Hebrews 1, we already saw that in the last days, God has spoken unto us by his son. In, in, in times past, God spake in divers manners unto the prophets or unto the fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken unto us by his son. God doesn't audibly speak to us anymore. He's give, we have His Word. We have all the Word of God. There's no more extra revelations that God is going to be given to us. It's complete. We have His Word. We're not going to be adding to Him. And, and you know, these people who say that, it, it may sound good. Oh, I got this Word from the Lord. And what it is, it's just a thought that they had. How do you know that came from God? Or if it's not a thought, maybe they're hearing voices. If you're hearing voices, then I'd be a little bit more concerned. <laughs> How do you know what the voice you're hearing is God? But there's a lot, I mean, it's a popular thing. But, oh, I got this word from the Lord, and he said this, and he said that, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. It's like, look, I don't buy it. And you know what? You, you watch when those things don't come to pass. That's how you know that person didn't hear from God. Because everything that God says comes true. But this is that warning, you know, add thou not. Turn if you would to Luke chapter 4. I want you to see this also. Luke chapter 4. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. But we have every word of God. We're going to see that here in Luke 4. Luke 4 is a chapter where Satan is tempting Jesus in the wilderness. Remember, Jesus goes off in the wilderness. Where after he gets baptized, he goes off in the wilderness, and, and he's out in the wilderness, and the devil comes, and he tempts him, and he, and he brings a few things before him, and Jesus you know, stands his ground, and of course doesn't fall into the temptation of the devil. But in verse number 3, one of the temptations of the devil, the Bible says, And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Remember, he's fasting in the desert, so he's hungry. And the devil's saying, Okay, okay, Son of God, if you're really the Son of God, if, if you are who you say you are, then why don't you, why don't you take this stone and, make, and turn it into bread? And he's tempting him. But I love Jesus' answer, verse number 4. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. God doesn't live, or man, excuse me, man doesn't live by bread alone. He's saying you need every word of God. Now, if we need to live by every word of God, we need every word of God. If he says man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God, we need every word of God. In order to survive, we need, every, we need to live by every word of God. How can he say that if we don't have every word of God? If it's just lost, I don't believe he'd be saying something that, that we need to have if we don't have it. Now, in order to have every word, God must preserve his word. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 12. Psalm 12. I'll read, while you're turning to Psalm 12, I'll read from you from Isaiah 59, 21, okay? In Isaiah, there's another uh, statement here that shows us God promising to preserve his word. And Isaiah, you're turning to Psalm 12, Isaiah 59, 21 reads, As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. So again, these are, right, these are God's words, saith the Lord. Well, we're reading these books. As for me, this is my covenant with them. Either God said that or he didn't. The Bible records that that is what God said. Those literal words. Now, if he said something different, but this is what this book says, that's not what, you know, it's, it's a lie. It's not what God said. It has to be exactly what he said or else it's a lie. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth. So again, he's explaining how he put his words in their mouth. Shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, of your children. My, my word that I put in your mouth. My word. It's not going to depart out of your mouth. It's not going to depart out of the mouth of your children, so he's saying, of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, so of your grandchildren, saith the Lord, from henceforth, from now, and forever. 
That is the word of God. God promised my words that I have just put into your mouth, Isaiah, they are not going to, they're going to continue to be said forever. They will continue. Look, if we don't have portions of God's word, like at least, at least here in Isaiah, I mean, God didn't keep his promise. But we know God keeps his promises. So this, this, this has to be true. So you're in Psalm 12. Look at verse number 6. Psalm 12, verse number 6. The words of the, of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Again, it's the same thing we saw in Isaiah 59. Hey, look, God, you're going to be the one. No, if, if I had to preserve them, I'll probably make mistakes. I'm not going to do it right. I'm human. I make errors. I'm, I'm, I'm not good at it. But God, if God's going to preserve them, then I can trust that God has preserved his word forever. That they still exist today just as they did back when David was right, penning down the book of Psalms. Because God is keeping them forever. If God, you know, is God powerful enough to make sure that his word will last through all time? Or do you believe in a weak God that, that, that is not able to use man to, to maintain the integrity of his word? See, people have this, this mindset, unfortunately, that it, 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 we can't have a perfect Bible because man screws things up without even realizing that, yes, while man screws things up, God doesn't. And when God makes a promise and he says very clearly, look, this word is going to continue from this generation and forever, we can believe him just as much as we can believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. How can you believe the words that are written regarding our salvation and salvation by grace through faith if you can't even rely on the word really being said by God or not, if you don't know that for sure? As soon as you start casting doubt, I go, well, was, is this really part of the Bible or not? I don't know. Is John 3.16 really part of the Bible or not? How could you really know that? Man makes mistakes. Maybe someone made a mistake really, really, really early on and that just kept continuing to get copied wrong. Where is your foundation? You know, we sang the solid rock this morning. Is it on these shifting sands? And, oh, well, we found another new document that's buried under a rock somewhere that dates back really old, and it says something completely different. So let's change everything that we believe because we found this old book that nobody used because it still exists thousands of years later. That someone else, you know, it, it, what's really funny is that in, in the, the manuscripts that's used in some of these versions, they pulled it out of the trash, Literally, like out of the trash in the Catholic Church, they found these manuscripts and they started, you know, oh, let's use these. It's in a wastebasket. It was already deemed. It was garbage. Leave it in the garbage can. Oh, no, this is important. Look, this is what it really says. This is older. It was trash. And it's pulled out and being used. I'm not looking up for yourself. I'm not making that up. Now, let's get into some of the differences. I'm going to start off. In Luke 4, because we already turned there. Remember, Luke 4, 4 is the, one, is, the, is the verse that says, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Remember, that's, that's, that's an important point. It's an important doctrine, even for the preservation of God's word. Hey, look, we need every word of God, right? I have for you, here I'm going to be using this, this um, parallel Bible. So we've got the living version and the NIV. Very popular versions today. If you go to a Bible, you know, a Christian bookstore, you'll find both of these very prominently. Not some off-the-wall version that's just like street language or something like that, you know, that, that a lot of people would be like, yeah, that's not the Bible. But both of these versions, let's see, this, uh, this is the NIV. I'll read the NIV first. Luke 4, 4, it says, Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone. That's where it stops. They've removed, but by every word of God. Now, isn't that ironic? The fact that we need every word of God is just removed from this entire version. That specific, of all phrases to remove in that verse, that one, but by every word of God, is gone. And of course, like I, I mentioned here, you, know, and you could look at this after service, there's a little asterisk here. And you look down, and 
apparently I need to go to the next page. I don't know where this one goes to. Oh, it just, it, oh, that's weird. It's just a reference. It doesn't, it doesn't even tell you that they removed any words. It just says Deuteronomy 8.3. It's just referring you back to, you know, like, a, like a, the, the reference from the Old Testament. But, um, yeah, it's just, it's just removed. It's, you'd never even know that that doesn't exist. By every word of God. The, the New living, uh, the living, the Living Bible. But Jesus replied, it is written in the scriptures, other things in life are much more important than bread. Other things in life are much more important than bread. As opposed to, we need to live by every word of God. It's just, well, other things are more important than bread. What other things? How about every word of God that you don't have in these books, in, this, in, in either one of these? You don't have every word. We talked about, uh, you know, doctrinal differences. Turn if you would to Acts chapter 8. Very, very common verse. You know, that, that's, this, is, this is huge. Acts chapter 8. You want to talk about doctrinal differences. Acts chapter 8, verse 36, a question is asked. This is a story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip goes up to this chariot and he, see, you know, he sees this man, he's in the chariot, and he's reading the Bible. And he goes up to him and he says, hey, do you understand what you're even reading? And the eunuch says, well, how can I accept some man should guide me? He's like, I don't know what, you know, I don't know what this means. So Philip preaches them Jesus Christ. He gives them the gospel. He preaches unto them how to be saved. So as they're going on their way, the eunuch, you know, they're in the chariot, and the eunuch says, hey, look, there's some water over there. Why can't I be baptized? Right? There's water right there. Can I be baptized? So he's, it was literally what he says, you know, what the Bible says is, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Why can't I be baptized? The New Versions, verse 37, the answer to that question is removed. So, if you were to remove verse 37, which they do in these modern versions, verse 38 says, and he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So why can't I be baptized? And he baptizes him without ever answering the question. And that verse is just completely removed. Again, that doesn't even make sense. To, to, it's in the reading to just, to just not have an answer. Well, look at what the King James Bible says in verse 37. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That is critical in understanding a requirement for baptism. You cannot get baptized unless you're a believer. You need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. And you say, oh, that's not that big of a deal. Oh, you could learn it from other places. Well, then why are the, the Catholic Church, the Presbyterian Church, all these Lutheran Church, all these different churches baptizing babies? If this verse is in the Bible, it clearly says you have to believe. Now, can an infant believe on Jesus Christ? No. But if this isn't in the text, well, there's no reason. He asked the question, why, why can't a baby be baptized? No reason. Apparently, there's no reason if that verse is removed. <laughs> I'm not going to even read this, but in you know, Mark 16, the new versions, will say that verses 9 through 20 don't belong there. Mark 16, it's, it's the, last, the last book, or the last chapter, excuse me, in the book of Mark. Mark. 16, with the, with the very, very famous ending. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature from Jesus Christ. When he said he gave him the great commission, new versions say, no, no, that really doesn't even belong in there. That's not, that, that was just added later on. Someone else just added that. All of verses 9 through 20. So they think, and, and here's, here's the other thing. Most of those people will say, well, they don't believe that the, the, the book ends at verse 8. They think it ends differently. It's not what we have in verses 9 through 20, but who knows what it should be. It's just lost. God didn't really preserve his word in the, end, the rest of the, of the, the gospel of Mark. 
I'm not going to trust that shifting sand with my salvation. I'm sorry, I'm not going to do it. God has promised to preserve his word. We have his word preserved. There's many other places. I'm not going to go into all of them. 1 Corinthians 1.18, you have to turn to the Bible, says that, um, but unto us which are saved, and in the new version it says, but unto us which are being saved, making it more of a process as opposed to something that's already done. Um, Mark 10.24 Yeah, that's a good one. I'm going to read this one. Turn, if you would, to Mark 10, 24. I should have just printed out these on my notes instead of having to turn to them, but that's okay. Mark 10, 24. So you can see in the King James Version, it says, And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? So they're astonished because he's saying that, uh, you know, people who are rich, he says it's hard for them. And was, well, he says, when you trust in riches, that's not going to save you, right? Trusting in how good you are, your own works, what you've accumulated. That's not going to save you. But in, uh, in these versions, it says, The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. How hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Let me ask you this morning, you that, that believe in Jesus Christ for your Savior, was it hard to get saved? Was that really difficult? To put your faith in the Lord? Is, is that a hard? Would you say to anybody, Yeah, you know what? Salvation's really hard. It's a real difficult thing. You know, it's so hard, you just have to receive a free gift. The NIV says, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. They remove the, for them that trust in riches. Yeah, it is hard for someone who's trusting in riches to get in the kingdom of heaven because that's not how you get there. You ain't going to make it. One more example. I want to give you an example from the New King James Version just because, just, just one example. Turn if you go to Matthew 7. Because some people will say, yeah, but the, okay, so you know, that's the NIV. You know, yeah, I don't use the NIV. I don't, I don't use those, those, those Bibles. But what about the New King James? Because people say, well, the King James is just kind of hard to read. It's hard to understand. I don't know the these and the thou. Well, okay, the thee and thou means you. I'll help you out right there. If you see the word thee, if you see the word thou, if you see the word ye, it means you. Very simple, all right? It's just thee and thou is singular. It's, you're talking to one person. Ye and you is plural. You're talking to many people. That's it. It's not that difficult. Okay, once you know that, great. Now you can understand a lot more. And you say, well, yeah, but those other words are kind of old. Yeah, okay, there are some words that are older. There, there are. I'll, I'll, I'll agree with you on that. But, you know, if you do a comparison, you do use any of these new versions, they have different words that are harder to understand and that you would need a dictionary to use to try to figure out what they're talking about than the King James Version. Now, I would also mention this, is that you say, well, the King James is kind of hard to read or hard to understand. Are you more interested in just what you feel is easier to understand? Or are you more interested in reading what God's real words are? Now, if God's real words are a little bit more difficult for you to understand, do you think it's maybe worth the extra effort? And I'm not trying to be too mean or sarcastic about this, but don't you think it might be worth the extra effort to, to, to try to gain a little bit more intelligence and, and maybe study the English language a little more or just read the Bible more, try to get in context, to, just so that you could have his, his, his true words as opposed to reading a lie because it's easier to understand? I mean, there's lots of books. My, my children's books are easy to understand, but they're not the holy words of God. You can have another book that calls itself a Bible that may be easier to understand, but it's not the Holy Bible. It's not God's words. So, you know, and people, people make that claim, oh, well, the New King James, 
They'll say this, it's still based on those texts, which it's not. It's, it, it's a mixture of the new. The New King James is, is kind of like the third category of Bibles because it mixes a lot of the, the King James readings and stuff with the newer version. And it's this, 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 this monster that's created as a result of mixing both of them together. But you still have problems. And, and what's a really interesting problem is found in Matthew 7, 14. Because... If this doesn't destroy your confidence in the New King James Bible, I don't know what will. Because you'll look at a lot of these verses that we looked at that's comparing to NIV and stuff, they're not incorrect in the, in the New King James Version. You could look at them and be like, oh yeah, we'll see this lines up with the King James. This is right. So there's less places to turn to. There's maybe less errors in the New King James, but it doesn't mean that it's without error. Matthew 7 Verse 14 in the King James Version says, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Common verse, right? Hey, that word straight literally means narrow, right? S-T-R-A-I-T, not G-H-T. You know, it's, it doesn't mean like a, like a line straight. It's just, it's narrow. You know, you think of a straight, like the Straits of Gibraltar. It's, it's this narrow place you go through from the sea. Okay, right? A straight, it's narrow. And then, he says, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. So, getting saved. Why is that narrow? Why is that straight? Because it's only through Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's narrow. As opposed to saying, well, you know, if you follow Islam, or if you follow Buddhism, or if you follow any of these other religions, as long as you're sincere and you love God, then you're going to be saved too. That's broad. But that's not the way salvation is. Salvation is narrow. It's only through. But does that make it difficult? No. Of course not. Well, that is unless you're reading a New King James. Because Matthew 7, 14 in the New King James says, Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, that's either true or a lie, that salvation is difficult or it's not. Is it, is it just narrow or is it difficult? They're two different words that mean completely different things. They can't both be the word of God. How do we determine what's right and what's wrong? Look, this is not God's word. I don't care that it says Holy Bible on it. It's not. This is not, this is not God's word. Salvation is not difficult. And you know, when people try to say, oh, well, there's just minor changes. That's not a minor change. Telling people that, that salvation is difficult, which is, you know, and then saying there's few that find it, that implies a works-based salvation. Saying, well, it's really hard to get saved and there's only a few people that even make it. Why, you know, if, if I'm reading that verse, I'm thinking, why do they even make it? Well, they must be working really hard. Because it's difficult. No. That's, I mean, that, that's, that's a lie. That's of Satan. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 1. Why is this so important? Why is the Word of God so important? Uh, we already read Romans 10. We need the Word of God to get saved. Why is it so important? Jesus Christ is the Word of God. And we get that from John chapter 1. Jesus is... Look... The words contained in this book is Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not standing up here making an idol out of this book with the pages and the, bind, the broken binding and stuff like that. I'm not talking about the physical manifestation of his words in this book of being Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ was God's word made in the flesh. And we're going to see that in John chapter 1. Let's look at, at verse number 1, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. 
He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the, will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory is of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth powerful verses here explaining look the word was with god the word was god now in the bible you find and i preached on this in the past names are not given for no reason all the names in the bible have a specific reason jesus was renaming people Simon was called Peter. Why? Because Peter means a stone, right? Why, why did, why did Abram, Abram's name get changed to Abraham? Why did Eve's name called Eve? Because she's the mother of all living. Why did these people have names? They all have meaning. They have significance. I don't believe that when the Bible is talking about Jesus Christ being the Word, oh, that's just some, some weird title. I don't know. Who knows why God called him that? No. It has a meaning. And they're using the Word. Just like the Lord has meaning. Why? Because he is the Lord. He's the boss. He's in charge. It has meaning. These names that God attributes have meaning, especially to the Son of God, to Jesus Christ, the Word. Why? Because he is the Word made flesh. Just as much as you need Jesus Christ for salvation, you need the Word of God to be saved because they're inseparable. Jesus is the Word. You need Jesus to be saved. You need the Word of God to be saved. They're both one and the same. Now, if you have a Word of God that has errors in it, that is corrupted, that is not, that's a different Jesus. That's a different word. That's a, that's a different God. We need a, a word that is pure, that is perfect, that is God. And we have that today. God has preserved that for us in the King James Bible. I don't believe that these modern translations are the result of an honest mistake. There are a lot of people who get involved in sin that make honest mistakes. We meet them all the time. There are people who are unsaved that, that are making honest mistakes. The Apostle Paul, he fought against the church, but he did it in ignorance, you know, in unbelief. In ignorance, he says, you know, he didn't, he didn't know any better. But these attacks, th these changes in God's Word, I believe are attacks. They're not just, it's not just a... Oh, well, I tried to do what was right and I just came out with something that's completely wrong. I don't believe that because Satan has always tried to attack God's word going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. When he was tempting Eve for eating of the forbidden fruit, he said, Yea, hath God said. Did God really say that? You shall not eat of every tree? Did he? And, and, and you know what he does? He causes doubt. He wants you to question God's word. Is that, really, is that really what God said? Is that really true? And then he went further after he questioned it to say, you shall not surely die. Which is a complete contradiction to what God actually said. He said, in the day that thou eatest of, thou shalt surely die. And Satan said, well, you're not really going to die. Because God knows that then you're going to be like God. He lied. But Satan attacks God's word, he perverts it and twists it, and I believe that the new versions are a result, whether the people themselves know it or not, they are pawns, they are tools that are at least used in Satan's plan to corrupt God's of attack on God's word. Which is why you see these strategic places that we, we return to that are critical places in Scripture that, how can you, how can you say salvation is difficult? That's an attack of Satan because he wants you to be confused, he wants you to think that, that salvation is not easy. We went out, Brother Sebastian and I went out soul winning, like, was it a week ago? We ran into those guys, the Hispanic guys that, uh, that um, you know, they had been to different, you know, the one guy had been to these different churches. He went to Mormon church, he went to Christian church, you know, he went to Catholic church, he went to all these different places. And now he's kind of at the point where he's just like, look, everybody's saying different things. There's all these different versions of the Bible out there. There's all this different stuff. And everyone's saying that they're right. And he's like, how do I know what to believe? 
And I could feel for I could empathize with him. But you know what? That's exactly what Satan wants. He wants you to be confused. Satan is the author of confusion. Satan is the deceiver. He's the one that's trying to trick me, trying to get you so confused that you just say, well, forget it. I don't think any of it's true because everyone's just saying different things. How do I know? But that's not true. You know, unfortunately, people go that route. It's the wrong choice to make. The truth exists. The truth is out there. God has preserved his word. You just, you just, you have to be able to receive it when you hear it. And my last point, you know, God wants us to be unified in the faith. He wants it. God doesn't want us all believing different things. He doesn't want everyone thinking, well, well, I think God means this and I think God means that. He doesn't want that. God's given us the, his word. It's true. They, you know, maybe sometimes we make mistakes. Or you know, I know I'm not perfect. There is probably something you could find that I believe that's not right because I'm not claiming to, to, to know everything. You know, I, I don't think it's wrong because otherwise I wouldn't be preaching it or believing it, but I am imperfect, right? But God doesn't want, God wants us all to be in unified, believing the same thing, using the same, do you think God wants us all here reading different books that all say something different? How are we going to be unified in the faith if, well, well, my book says it's difficult to be saved. Well, mine says it's just narrow. God doesn't want that. He wants us all. And this is, you know, people will say, oh, you King James only people, you're so divisive. No, I want to be unified. Let's all use this Bible because this one's good. We had it already for hundreds of years and it was the right one. God preserved it. Stop bringing in all this new stuff. We don't need it. We don't need it. It's a perversion. Get rid of it. Let's be unified in the faith using God's word, using what he's already given to us that he's promised. And look, if God promised from this generation forever, that's, that's, that's a continual thing. It's not like, oh, well, this was under a rock and now all of a sudden, you know, God preserved it, just nobody knew about it for, for a thousand years. That's not how God preserves his word. He continually preserves it. It's something that goes out of the mouth of your children and your children's children and their children's children and their children's children, you know, just, just forever. It continues and is preserved that way. And God has, has promised to do that. So this, this, this version, this, this uh, concept, or the, not the concept, but the, the doctrine of the King James Bible and, and believing that this is the Bible to use in the English language is an extremely important one. Hopefully, you know, if you weren't convinced before, you're convinced now. I've got more information up here too, which I, I'm completely out of time. I mean, I know it's a long sermon. I apologize for that. But uh, uh, there are way even more examples of things that were changed in addition to what you already have in that handout for the verses that are completely removed from the NIV. And this shows you the NIV, the New American Standard, and the New World Translation, and all the differences that are there. Some of them are the same, but, and this is not all of them either. I was just going to, I was going to actually, if I had time, point out more differences and contradictions and everything else that you could find in these new versions. But this is a resource for you. If you, if you are convinced that you want this information, it's yours to have. I can make copies of it if you'd like. But um, it's important also to share with family and friends and other people because, look, these books that I have over here are books of lies. They are twisted. They are perverted. You could say, oh, in some places they say the same thing, but it's a part where they're twisted is where, you know, that's the big problem. God has preserved his word. We have in the King James Bible. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, for your promises and, and being able to be sure and confident that we have your words, dear God, and that we can trust your words and that we don't have to doubt your words, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just, just help us to stand firm on the solid rock of Jesus Christ, which is the word of God. Pray that you would please just continue to, to, to speak to our hearts, dear Lord, and help us to never waver on such a core foundational doctrine of your word, dear Lord. And help us not to be led astray and, and really to watch out when people aren't using your words here, God, how can we trust? If they don't have the discernment to know where your word lies, how can we trust that they're going to teach us anything true, dear Lord? So help us to watch out for the teachers that are using other perversions of the Bible, uh, Lord, and, and just to stick with, with, with your holy word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.